you, David. Good morning, everyone. Happy Father's Day, men, to all you fathers, grandfathers, some great-grandfathers. Happy Father's Day. Um, If you guys will open your Bibles, let's go in the New Testament to Mark's Gospel, chapter 4, verse 1. And so we're looking at chapter 4 today. Today, 57 years ago today... Mike and Shirley were married, so today is their 57th uh, wedding anniversary. What a blessing. Great glory to God. Amen? Amen. And they were giving him glory this morning before the service. So we want to thank the Lord for them. Um, We want to pray for Joe and Patty. Joe is home uh, from Medford from the hospital. He's home in Brookings. in a hospital bed in their home and uh, spent time with him yesterday and asked him what can we pray for for you this morning as a church and he said strength and endurance so um, and of course healing so we want to pray for that and he prayed for you and I and all of us this morning for our church service together And then a praise report from um, Nicole, Jeff, and Becca, and the team in Africa, in Malawi. Everything's going great. And next Sunday morning, as we're meeting here, they will be in the air flying home and landing home. But um, Jeff wants to thank all of us for our prayers. And so if you'll keep on praying, seems like they just left. It's been two weeks already. And uh, and then also... um, want to pray for Pete's mom, Dorothy, this morning. And she's home from the hospital, three hip fractures. Um, We want to pray for healing for that. So if you guys will join me right now, please. Lord, we come to you and we give you praise and honor and glory. Lord, and we need you. Lord, you told us that we can do nothing without you. And Lord, you are the one, and we thank you for Mike and Shirley, Lord, and for 57 years ago, as you you united them in marriage, Lord, with sacred vows, and you have been, Lord, the one, the love in their marriage, the one, Lord, helping them daily, and all the glory and honor and praise goes to you, and they give that to you. We thank you for them. We pray for this year ahead and be blessed with health. And uh, draw them even closer than they are right now, Lord, we pray. So we thank you for them, Lord. Lord, we all lift you, Joe, right now. I know Joe, Lord, he's, he's laying there in that bed and he's praying for us right now. That's who he is. And uh, we want to lift him up to you, Lord. He has asked for your strength and endurance and for healing, Lord. And we ask you, Lord, to place your healing hands upon our dear brother, Be with he and Patty, Lord. Lord, we're asking for healing for Joe and just strength and endurance, Lord. And then just thank you, Lord, for his humility and his heart of faith and his love for all of us. Lord, the team in Africa, we give you praise. Bring them home safe. Keep them healthy this week. Thank you for using them. Um, They're spending themselves for you, Lord. Help them this week to finish well and just to continue to do that and bring them home safe. And Lord, right now, we lift you, Dorothy, at home, Pete's mom, and we ask for healing for her, Lord, that you would touch her and strengthen her and heal her. Thank you for your love for each of us in this room. You know our needs, Lord, and you do this miraculous thing, Lord, where you, by your Holy Spirit, take your word and meet the needs and speak to each of our hearts no matter where they are and we ask for that this morning and lord may we as fathers be strengthened and encouraged and and may joe's prayer lord be our prayer for fathers lord that we would have strength and endurance all in you so we ask these things in jesus name and all god's church said Amen. amen well happy father's day every once in a while i come across this quote Um, that I seem to need. How about you? It's it's so good. If you feel that you do not have the strength to take another step, the good shepherd 
will do one of two things, our Lord Jesus. He will give you strength for the next step, or he will call a halt so you can rest and gain strength for the next step. Isn't that good? Sometimes he takes us to the wall and we feel like we can't go on, and I'm just thinking he wanted me to share that this morning. Lord, do you want to do a special Father's Day message? And it was yes, but it's going to be right where we are in Mark because he has us right here in Mark 4. And we all need to hear this today. But I'm going to read to the men right now something out of 1 Corinthians 16. Paul said, watch and stand fast in the faith. Be brave. Um, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. There's kind of an echo. Okay, thanks. And um, so let me start over. Men, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong, let all that you do be done with love. What a great encouragement for fathers. When Paul says be brave, literally it means act like men. English Standard Version says act like men. Young's literal translation says be men. Amen? And that's what we need in this world today is to just be men the way God intended men to be. And uh, one more thing before we get into Mark. My wife gave me a framed picture and there's a printed quote on it you know, printed on like parchment paper and then behind it is the American flag and, uh, and I love it and it's a quote by Thomas Jefferson and it says, when the people fear the government, there is tyranny. When the government fears the people, there is liberty. Amen? And uh, it's time again for the government to fear and respect the people uh, because we are a nation of liberty. But when the people fear the government, and he was our third president of the United States. Okay, let's pick it up in Mark 4, 1. It says, and again, he, Jesus, began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude was gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea, and the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. So last week we talked about like a small rowboat was kept ready because the crowds were pressing in and almost crushing the Lord, wanting to touch him to be healed. You guys, this is like a larger fishing boat, the ones they would use to fish. Hold that thought because um, that's the meaning here. How did that work? And we'll get into that. If you go down the shore from Capernaum, there's a little cove on the north shore of the Sea of Galilee, and it's between Capernaum and the mouth of the Jordan River. And just, it's like one of those places where you, you walk off the shore and within a few yards, it goes deep so it could handle a boat like that, right? And, um, and then right there at that place, the landscape creates like a natural amphitheater. The beach rises rapidly from the water right there. And the land then slopes gently up. And in the springtime, there's grass and wildflowers. And you know, and if there's a slight breeze coming off um, the Sea of Galilee, then Jesus' voice would carry so that thousands might hear him clearly. You know, we're on a PA system, a sound system now, so you can hear my voice. And then I've read things by a number of people who have actually been in Israel. And I just read something, you know, and, uh, and this pastor said that he went down when he was a young man, young man on a trip. The teacher took him and he said, okay, you stand down here at the shore of the lake and I want you to read this passage that we're reading in the Bible now, but I want you to just talk in a conversational tone. Don't raise your voice, just talk in a conversational tone and we're gonna go way up on the hill, right? And so they did and they could hear him perfectly and clearly. And so God created, don't ask me how that works, but there's places where, so imagine Jesus sitting in the boat and the great multitude, and last week we talked about tens of thousands of people all on the shore in a natural amphitheater, and he's sitting in the boat and he's speaking and his voice and the breeze is taking it up the hill and everyone can hear him and he's just talking in a normal tone of voice. 
amazing, and God created it that way. So this is the picture of what's going on. Well, he's going to start teaching in parables. What's a parable? A simple word picture with profound spiritual lessons. Using everyday stories about commonplace incidents, objects, or persons. And we know that our Lord, from reading his word, he's the master storyteller. So he would make up stories to illustrate and help explain a truth. And he would make them simple on purpose because he wants us to understand his word. The word parable means to place alongside, so it means a comparison. So what the Lord would do, he'd take two things that are alike in some way, always something normal from everyday life, but he's trying to teach us something spiritual, and there would be something about him that is the same. And uh, it would always be a comparison that applied to some truth in the spiritual realm. So here they're all sitting, and he's going to start teaching, and he's going to start his parables. And we're looking at the very first one he ever taught. And the people sitting there, because he's using things he wants them to already know about, they're going to be really familiar with what he's talking about that day because they lived in a farming culture, right, an an agrarian culture. And so what he's going to describe that we see today, that's part of everyday life. It's like everyone would know what he's talking about. If you're sitting there in that place on the shore, you might even be able to see in the distance um, what he's talking about because grain fields covered the landscape of Galilee farming and they would see, it was an everyday occurrence, right? Familiar sight to see a man with a seed bag over his shoulder and he's scattering seed and he's the farmer. And so they all knew what he was talking about. So we pick it up in verse 2, his first parable, and the Lord says, it says, Then he taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow. Okay, a staple of their diet was wheat. So in their mind, they're thinking of wheat right now. And as we go on and look at more parables, Jesus used wheat in the parables. So think of a wheat field, and that's what they're thinking of. Now, their fields were these long, narrow strips of land, no fences, no hedges, right? The only borders were footpaths because you you would need to walk through the fields or around them. And uh, those were their fields. And then you would need to prepare the, the ground to sow the seeds. So you'd get the family, you'd go pick up all the rocks, you'd get the old brush, the old growth, you'd clear it off. And now you're looking at this just field of dirt, and it all looks the same. Well, what's underneath? You don't know yet. What's underneath the dirt? But on the top, it all looks the same. And that's part of of Jesus' story today. Now, we automatically have a tendency to think, okay, now he's going to go out there and he's going to plow it like we do with like a John Deere tractor. And then they're going to put the seed in the ground, right, and cover it up. But that's not what they did. Instead, on that flat ground that's been cleared of all the rocks and everything, they would scatter the seed on top of the ground. Then they would plow, and in the plowing, it would turn and it would cover the seed. Kind of the opposite of what we think. And so you'd see a sower, a man, he'd carry his supply of seed in a bag. It's slung around his neck and his shoulders. It's either going to be hanging right in front of him or at his side. And you guys liberally, right, generously, he would reach in and he'd take handfuls of seed and he'd fling them like a Frisbee, right, across the path, like as far as he can, liberally. You know, we think of like you're going with one seed at a time doing this. Oh, no, it's like haven't plowed yet. Remember, the ground's flat. You're going to plow afterwards. What you're trying to do is just evenly scatter seed all over that whole field. Sometimes what they would do if they didn't have a bag, they'd simply take the corner of their their work robe, right? And they'd just pull it up to make a pocket, right? And, you know, and have the seed in that. So that would cover large areas of ground with evenly scattered seed. And then again, they'd come behind and scratch the seed into the soil with a primitive wooden plow, usually or often pulled by oxen. Okay, now, as we go on, remember, what's the Lord doing? It's a comparison. He takes something 
like we're talking about now, like the field, the seed, something they know and understand, and he wants to teach them. And you guys, I'm going to tell you right now, the two things he's comparing are the soil. Remember, it's flat. What's underneath? You don't know what's underneath. And he's comparing the ground, the soil, to the human heart. And so that's what he's doing to have them understand. So in verse 4, it says, Jesus is teaching, and he says, And it happened as he sowed, that some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds of the air came and devoured it. Now, as you're doing that, like throwing a frisbee, right? And you come, you got those paths around the field. Some is going to end up past the edge and onto that. And they're not too concerned about that because, you know, that's just life. And uh, so when Jesus says here, some seed, <coughs> excuse me, fell by the wayside, he's talking about those surrounding footpaths. That's the wayside. So this is the roadside soil well-beaten footpaths that separated the fields from one another. <clears throat> and the soil there is hard-baked earth, always remained unplowed. They never plowed that, ever. So it just kept getting harder and harder. People are walking on it, and especially when it's dry, they're hard as concrete. So imagine the seed landing on that. It'd be like the seed landing on the blacktop out there, you know. No hope of penetrating that soil, and so the birds of the air would come and devour it. Okay, let's go on to verse 5 and 6. But again, remember, comparison, parable, he's talking about soil and the human heart. Some fell on stony ground, Jesus says, where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Okay, he says some fell on stony ground. Okay, this is rock, but you guys, it's not a rocky slab on the surface, right? It's not on the rock on the surface. That's all dirt, and it doesn't mean um, rocky soil like a patch of ground that's full of large rocks because when they plowed the field... After they sowed, any rocks that came up to the surface, they'd remove them, they'd carry them away. What the Lord's talking about is a rock ledge that's underneath the field surface. And it's covered by a shallow layer of topsoil. So think of an unbroken, underlying rock ledge. <clears throat> you know, if you just have a lot of rocks, you know, underneath the ground. <clears throat> Thank you. That's my daughter, Kristen, so thank you. Now I'm going to sound like I got marbles in my mouth. But um, You notice roots, if there's even an opening, they'll make their way through. So this isn't a lot of rock or just gravel underneath with a layer of soil. This is like a solid, like the floor underneath you, solid rock flooring underneath the ground that they that the farmer doesn't know is there an unbroken underlying rock ledge but on top of it there's a shallow layer of soil but that wouldn't be deep enough or stay wet or moist enough to sustain the crops especially in a dry climate it's invisible to the farmer he doesn't know it's there when he plowed that plow, that wooden plow, the plowshare would only go from about 8 to 10 inches deep. That layer of rock might be a foot deep, a couple inches deeper. So you didn't hit it, you didn't know. And what would happen is that rock that wasn't that deep underneath, it would absorb the heat through that you know, little bit of soil on top, and that rock would get hot, and it would absorb that heat. When that seed was planted then and turned over, that heat from the rock caused the seed to germinate unusually fast and have a rapid growth in that shallow layer of topsoil on top of the rock. But there's no room for the roots to grow, right? There's only so much soil, and it can't go through that solid you know, shelving of rock. can't get past it. So any moisture that came when the sun comes up quickly evaporates, and um, no moisture to sustain that original rapid growth. So... What would happen at first, you go out when everything starts to grow and you're the farmer and you look and where that rock is, you'd go, wow, those plants are growing faster than the rest 
and they have this abundant topside growth because there's no room for the roots to go. So you get this immediate like, you go, wow, those ones are growing higher and faster than anything else. But if you're an experienced farmer, you know, okay, this isn't good because it's a sign and it means the crops are not developing an adequate root system down below. So for a little while, it looks really good. It looks really healthy. Remember, he's comparing soil to our human hearts. For a little while, it looks really good. But when the sun comes up and the water is gone, just as quickly as it came up, it dies out. And it, and it dies. Well, let's go on. Jesus goes on to verse, in verse 7. And again, remember, he's telling a story of comparison, talking about the soil and the human heart. And he says, And some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Okay, this is weed-infested soil. Underneath the soil, it's full of useless wild vegetation, roots of weeds, roots of thorns, nettles, thistle, still in that soil. Harmful to the crops because they're just going to take over and choke out everything else. Have you noticed weeds grow faster and better than anything else? Have you noticed that? That's part of the curse, right, when Adam and Eve sinned. So what's going to happen is those weeds and the thorns are going to soak up all the, the soil, out of the, uh, the moisture out of the soil. They're going to drain the nutrients out of the soil. And then on the outside, they're going to block the sunlight because they're going to grow up faster and higher and, um, you know, choke out the life of the wheat that's planted in that field. And it's only a matter of weeks before... Those thorns and thistles overtake the wheat plants in, in, uh, in height. And so plenty of moisture um, in that soil, but it's competing with the roots underneath and the thistles and thorns above, and it's just being choked out. But remember, he's talking about some people's hearts. Okay, one more. There's four kinds of soil and four kinds of hearts. Remember, he's comparing the boat, the two. In verse 8, Jesus says, But other seed fell on good ground, and it yielded a crop that sprang up, increased and produced, some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some a hundred. And he said to them, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Okay, you guys, this is fertile soil, good, clean soil, free from weeds, soft, able to be plowed, that seed gets down into the soil, it penetrates deeply, it flourishes, produces this abundant crop. Now, produces 30, 60, 100. A hundredfold, it's not referring to the number of seeds that each seed would yield. It's talking about the return on the farmer's original financial investment. So if you're in Israel in those days, for every denarius, that you spent on seed. You'd go buy the seed to scatter, right? For every denarius that you spent on that seed, when the crop came up, you'd earn a hundred denarii. That's a hundredfold in the sale of your crop. So for every denarii you spent on seed, you got a hundred back. And so that's, and in those days, you guys, so they're listening and now the Lord really has their attention because if you just got a tenfold return, that would be a healthy return. And they all know an average field, that's only tenfold or less. He's talking 30 or 60. That would be something spectacular. That would be a bumper crop. But now he's talking a hundredfold. That's a staggering profit. And uh, a hundredfold signified extraordinary blessing from God. In the Old Testament, Isaac and Rebekah were forced by a famine for a little while to live in the land of the Philistines. And in Genesis 26, it says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. Now listen to this. It says, The man began to prosper and continued prospering until he became very prosperous. That kind of sounds like 30, 60, and 100. Sounds like God's prospering him. He began to prosper. There's 30-fold. Continued prospering. There's 60-fold. Until he became very prosperous, there's that hundredfold. 
By the way, that's God's plan for you and I, and I'll tell you that now. Well, looking at Mark 4.10, it says, But when he, Jesus, was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parable, and he said to them, To you it has been given to know the mystery of the kingdom of God, but to those who are outside, they haven't believed yet. All things come in parables. Now notice these two words in verse 12, So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. Now listen carefully. It kind of sounds here, and Mark's been accused of that, it kind of sounds like our Lord doesn't want them to perceive and understand, and he's trying to hide it from them. It sounds that way. You know, the same story is in Matthew chapter 13, verse 13. So hold your place there in Mark. And if you'll turn, please, to Matthew 13, 13. We should and need to interpret what Mark is saying here by comparing it with Matthew. Jesus used parables because of the spiritual blindness of the people, because they didn't understand. And his desire, you guys, was not to hide the truth from those who deliberately rejected him. But because of their unbelieving attitude, he's using parables to try to get their attention and then to get them thinking about the parables. In other words, all scripture, if we look at the whole Bible, makes it clear it's never God's intention to keep people from turning away from sin. He's, he wants everyone to be saved. Here's the thing, though. If you're just talking to someone that doesn't understand yet, and you're talking principles, and they don't believe, in, right? They're not going to necessarily remember that. But you know what they'll remember? A story. They'll remember a story. And that's the idea. They're hearing without understanding now, but they're going to remember the stories. And then in the future, the hope is that their hearts will be able to receive its meaning and the meaning will become clear to them. It's kind of like we always only remember so much. And um, what did you learn at school today? You know, and we don't remember the math problem. Oh, the teacher told us this story, right? And that's what we're going to hold on to. That's the idea. Now they have it in their heart, right? And the Holy Spirit can use that. Well, it sounded in Mark, same two words, so that. I'll read it to you. You're in Matthew. Don't go back. I'm just going to read it to you to refresh you. In Mark, it says that Jesus said, So that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And it sounds like, and some people make a mistake, and they go, He didn't want them to hear, and he didn't want them to believe. Let's read Matthew. It really makes it clear. Same account, same story. Matthew says it a little differently. Therefore, Jesus is speaking. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. And in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, Hearing you will hear and shall not understand, and seeing you will see and not perceive. For the hearts of this people have grown dull. He's not blinding their hearts. It's their own free will. Their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn. Here's our two words, so that I should heal them. See, that's his heart. So you've got to put the two together because back, if you'll go back to Mark chapter 4 in verse 12, At the end of verse 11, Jesus says, All things come in parables, so that seeing they may see and not perceive, and hearing they may hear and not understand, lest they should turn and their sins be forgiven them. And people say, see, he's, he's judging them and keeping some people from knowing. Not true. Those same two words, so that, Matthew uses, and he says, Jesus says, so that I should heal them. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Pastor Chuck Smith, now in heaven, he said, Now, is Jesus trying to hide the truth to keep man from conversion? No. Parables are used to attract attention and to illustrate truth. 
The people were not listening to the teachings anymore, and yet it was still important that they still hear the word. And so Jesus used the parables, even though in hearing they did not understand, yet it was important that they hear. So just think simply the idea is, what are you going to remember? They're not listening to his teaching anymore. They're just after the miracles, right? And we talked about that last week. But now he's using stories and parables, and they're going to remember that. And then the Holy Spirit's going to be able to use that to open their eyes, hopefully, as time goes on. So in verse 13 of Mark 4, And he, Jesus, said to them, Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. Now who's the sower? Jesus is and you are. Anyone who distributes the seed. You guys, listen. What is the seed? The seed is the word of God, specifically the gospel, how to get saved. The seed is God's word. And let's just say this. It's the unchanged word of God, the unchanged gospel, because that's the only true and legitimate seed. Today, many people are altering the seed. You know, if you want to have a woke church, you're altering the seed, okay? You are. Um, The world today, many people, right, they're altering the seed. They either try to update the message of the gospel. They try to tone down the offense of the cross, right? Don't want to offend anyone by telling them they're a sinner and they'll be separated from God forever if they don't confess their sins, repent of them, and believe in Jesus and then follow him, right? Don't want to, so let's leave out the hard and unpopular parts of the message. And then there's people, they just simply replace the gospel, totally different message. Now remember, what's the soil? It's the human heart, right? The only factor in the difference with the four soils is the condition of the soil. And so now it's the condition of the heart. That's the only factor, right? So the seed is the pure gospel. The key that unlocks the parable is that the seed is the word of God, specifically the gospel. And that is proven in Luke's account in chapter 8, 12. And we got to understand that the soil is a picture of the human heart. So I'm going to ask you, hold your place where you are and turn to Luke 8, 12. And it's the same story, the same parable. But it makes it very clear. So just the one verse 12 is going to show us two things. He's going to, it's going to prove to us that the soil is the human heart. And it's going to prove to us that the seed is the gospel. Luke 8, 12. Jesus says, those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts. The birds ate the seed on the hard path, right? Where did the devil take the seed away? out of their hearts, so the hearts, the soil, lest they should believe and be saved. So now we know the specific word is what? The gospel. First Peter chapter 1, verse 23 says that you and I are born again, not of corruptible seed like the one you would scatter on the ground, but incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God. I think of like that seed penetrating the soil and going deep. The word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So who's the sower? The Lord is, but he uses you and I. Romans 10.17 says that, that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, cast the word of God, the word of God preached, the seed, it's sown. It reaches the heart of the listener. And you guys, it reaches each of the four different types of soils. It reaches and it makes contact. We can't see in some inside of somebody's heart and see what type of soil their heart is, our calling and our job is to what? Just sow the seed. Just share the word. Well, Jesus is going to explain it to them. So let's look at verse 15. He says, These are the ones by the wayside, the hardened path, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. 
So you guys, unbelief and the love of sin have made this human heart as hard as concrete where the truth cannot penetrate. So we might say, you know, sometimes we'll say it goes in one ear and out the other or it's like water off of a duck's back, right? Really hard. Matthew, in the same story, says when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, Jesus is speaking and does not understand it. Then the wicked one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is he who receives seed by the wayside. And so they hear it and they've got it in their thought, right? In their mind. But it doesn't go any farther from their heart, from their mind and their thoughts down into their heart. So we picture in our mind like seed sitting on that hardened path and it can't penetrate. Just that where everyone walks, it's hard. It's never going to get down in there. That hardened path, think of it, it's in their thoughts, right? And that's where the battle takes place, the spiritual battle in this world. And so what happens is it's lying exposed there in their, in their mind until the enemy, Satan, or one of his demons comes along, and they're going to remove that out of the mind, right? And they're going to use the power of suggestion or persuasion, lies and deception, and, they're gonna, and, and, and it never goes deeper than that. He goes on in verse 16, the Lord says, second kind of ground, second kind of heart. These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. Matthew says they receive it with joy. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. Now, you know what I want to say? We need this today because, you guys, it's telling us what's going on in the world we're living in. He's got tens of thousands of people he's speaking to. Everyone sitting there fell into one of those four categories. If we were there, we can't see in their hearts, but everybody's going to be one of those four types of soil. There's not a fifth type, and everyone's going to fall into that category. It's the way our world is today. It explains a lot of what's going on, and we need to know this because we're called to share the truth, but we don't know what's going on in anybody's heart, and we won't. But it also helps helps us explain a lot of what's going on around us in the world right now because a lot of people say they're a Christian and they're a believer. Here he says in verse 16, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves and so endure only for a time afterward when tribulation and we're in it or persecution and it's coming arises for the word's sake. Immediately they stumble. And you know what happens is they didn't count the cost. They heard the message and they didn't count the cost of giving their heart to Christ. So question is, what is the cost? What is the cost to become a Christian and follow the Lord? Where's the line? How much do you want, Lord? How much do you want of us? How much do we need? You did it all for us. What do you require in return for me to be saved? What is the cost? The answer, everything. Everything. He wants complete obedience, complete surrender. There is no line. There is no limit. He gave all. He asks all. And that's normal Christianity. And yet these people fall away kind of like that crop growing up, but it's got that rock ledge underneath. Hey, I prayed and I gave my heart to the Lord. Well, where are you now? And where are a lot of Christians now? And as things get difficult in this world, it explains a lot of what's going on. And um, so these people never truly believed in the first place. Either did the the soil on the hard ground never became a Christian. That seed never penetrated. This one even prayed and said, hey, I'll give my heart to the Lord. But then when it got difficult, they walked away. Did they ever really get saved? Remember we talked about last week in John chapter 2 at the first Passover? It said many believed in Jesus when they saw all the miracles and the signs he was doing. But he did not commit himself to them because he knew what was in the heart of men. 
And we said that many believed, that word believed and the Lord didn't commit. They're the same, they come out of the same word. And he's looking in the heart and he can see that there's that rock shelf underneath. And the only reason you're following me is because of the miracles, but you don't want me and you're not making that commitment to me where you're giving me everything and laying your life down to follow me. And so I'm not committing myself to you. Were they truly saved? No, they fell away. It's what we're talking about here. There was a point, and I want to ask you this. It says, from that time, it's in John chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. If you read that passage, why did a lot of them turn around and walk away? Because he said something hard and difficult that they couldn't understand. So as soon as it got a little bit hard, they decided to leave. Well, they walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the 12, do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. So I want to ask you, because as Joe and I talked yesterday, we were talking about this. Um, Every once a while in our lives, in all of our lives, it's happened in mine. How about you? Um, And I was the one sharing this with Joe because I knew I was going to share it with you this morning, right? The Lord will ask you and I, do you also want to go away? And we can be walking with him for years. And every once in a while, it's usually when things get so hard. They get so hard. And it's as if the Lord is saying, do you also want to walk away? And you guys, what's the answer? Are you going to walk away? Praise God, you're here this morning. Peter's answer was, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, then he goes on in verse 18, and the Lord says, Now these are the ones, the third type of soil, that are sown among thorns. And they are the ones who hear the word. And the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. Careful, are these people saved? No. No fruit, right? It's choked out. Worldly interests choke out the message of the gospel, and it can't bear fruit. They have a love for the world. And you guys, a love for the world right? And everything in the world and a love for the word, the word of God, they're incompatible, mutually exclusive. The one is going to choke out the other. And yet it's a lie. Careful. We can think, oh no, I'm a Christian, but I'm pursuing all of these other things also. And it explains a lot of what is going on at that day and in our day. Those who truly love our Lord Jesus will what? forsake the world. Those who love the world will what? They'll forsake our Lord Jesus Christ and they become spiritually unfruitful. In other words, what confuses us sometimes is we say they prayed the prayer and they'll say, I prayed the prayer. Do we need to understand this? Yes, we do because people truly do need to be saved. So let me ask you right now, what kind of ground and soil are you and your heart? Okay, as we go on, Jesus said, no servant can serve two masters for either he will hate the one and love the other or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. So just a thought, since it is Father's Day, let's just make a quick application. Fathers, grandfathers, great grandfathers. What are we teaching our children and grandchildren and great grandchildren And this is the reality of life and what's going on. And we want to be the good ground. He goes on in Mark 4.20, the fourth kind of ground. And he says, Jesus says, but these are the ones sown on good ground. Those who hear the word, accept it and bear fruit. Some 30 fold, some 60 and some 100. So you know what this is? Soft, clean, fertile soil of true belief. Now, don't make this mistake. This is a mistake. Oh, there's some people in here who the Lord wants to bring, have you bring 30-fold 
fruit for him. And there's others that he wants to bring 60-fold. And then there's some who he wants to bring 100-fold fruit. And he's decided that, and that's his will. Uh, Not so at all. Um, He wants everyone to produce 100-fold fruit. 100-fold, right? Yes. So... Just like he wants everyone saved, if they would, of their own free will, choose to believe in him. Um, He wants to produce fruit. Every believer keep increasing in the abundance of the fruit in their life, all the way up to a hundredfold. Question, does every believer, does every true believer have the word of God? Yes. Does every true believer have the Holy Spirit living inside? Yes. Would that equal 30-fold for some people? And 60-fold for others and 100 for others, and we have the same Holy Spirit and the Word of God? No, it's going to be 100-fold for everybody. So what determines that 30, 60, 100? And it's going to be how much we willingly surrender our hearts to Him in obedience and yield to Him. Listen carefully. You remember Jesus said, I'm the vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch, that's every true believer in His church, in me that bears fruit, Think 30-fold. He prunes that it may bear more fruit. 60-fold. I'm the vine, you're the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. That's a hundredfold. For without me you can do nothing. By this is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. Think of a hundredfold. So what I'm trying to tell you is Jesus said, I want fruit and then my Father's going to prune you for more fruit and then there's going to be much fruit, abundant fruit. Kind of sounds like 30, 60, 100, right? You see how that goes together? That's what God wants. Every believer keep increasing in the abundance of fruit in their life. So really quickly, what's fruit? And there's seven things I'm going to share with you, and I'm not going to turn you there in the interest of time. What are the kinds of spiritual fruit in the Bible? Think of this in a general sense, a changed life. A changed life. Is your life changed by the Lord? He comes to live within us because he's supposed to be seen in our life. As he lives his his life in us and through us, there should be a totally changed life and Jesus Christ should be able to be seen in our lives. This last Wednesday, by the way, if you want to come, we're in the book of Exodus and we did um, Exodus 3 where Moses is standing at the burning bush. And I'm just going to take that right now because a lot of you were here that night, but a lot of you were not. Moses is standing at the burning bush and Jesus, the angel of the Lord, also called the Lord and God in that same passage, meaning the angel of the Lord is an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. Who was the one in the burning bush? Jesus Christ, an Old Testament appearance. He's speaking to Moses. And he says, take your sandals Off your feet for the place where you stand is holy ground. It's the first time we find the word holy in the Bible. And whenever we find a word for the first time, it gives us a clue as how the word is used in the rest of Scripture. Do you remember when God created everything in Genesis? He said he created the earth, he created the soil, and he said it was good. The earth I created is good. And then at the end of creation, he said everything was very good. So the soil and the ground, take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground that was good and even very good is now holy. What's the difference? That which was good now becomes holy, and the answer is clear and simple. The presence of Jesus Christ in the midst of that bush, God's manifest presence changes it to holy. When we give our heart to the Lord, he comes to live within us. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. First time it's used is holy ground because I'm now here. He now lives in us. Wouldn't that mean a changed life? Yes. Hold that thought, though. Take your sandals off because you're standing on holy ground. And now the same one that was in the midst of the burning bush is teaching, has come in the flesh to die for our sins. And he's talking about four different kinds of ground and soil. And he's talking about the last one, which is good ground. The one who truly believes in that good ground becomes holy because he comes to live within. 
So, in a general sense, fruit is what? A changed life, and Jesus should be seen. But it's kind of like this. When, when the spies went into the promised land, the 12 of them, and they came back, they just took, it says they, then they came to the valley of Eskol, that's in the promised land, and there cut down a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they carried it between the two of them on a pole. So can you imagine two men, and we're just going to cut down one bunch of grapes in the promised land, and it's so big, they had to put it on a pole and carry it between them. One bunch of grapes, well, that's you. You are that one bunch of grapes. Changed life, right? Abundant fruit, hundredfold. Think of that. But let's talk about seven specific things. What would that look like? And in our life, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, his love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. That's one of seven things named as fruit. A changed life. Number two, fruit to holiness. Romans talks about, Paul said, you have your fruit to holiness. First time the word's used, you're standing on holy ground because the Lord is there. He lives within us. There's going to be a holiness. That's fruit. Number three, he says the fruit that comes out of our hearts and then our mouths. Um, For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Number four, the fruit of our lips, giving thanks and praise to God. Number five, the fruit of good works. Um, Paul said being fruitful in every good work. Number six, the fruit of souls saved, both sowing and reaping and souls coming to know the Lord. And number seven, the fruit of Christian giving to the Lord from a dedicated life. Paul said in Titus 3, and let our people also learn to maintain good works, to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. So let me put that together. Here's what the Lord's saying to us this morning, right? Putting all those seven things, him living his life in the midst of us, Jesus would say, I greatly desire my fruit of the Spirit in your lives, my love, joy, peace, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I desire my fruit to holiness in your hearts and lives. I desire my good fruit that comes out of the abundance of your hearts, for then it will flow from your mouths when you speak. I desire a continual offering of the sacrifice of praise from you, the fruit of your lips, giving thanks to my name. I desire for you to maintain good works, walking worthy of me, fully pleasing me, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in your knowledge of me. I desire the fruit of your giving to me, meeting urgent needs because of your devotion to me. I greatly desire my hundredfold harvest for you to both sow and reap, for the fruit of, uh, will be soul saved. I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are, are already white for harvest. A completely changed life because the risen Lord lives within us. So simple question, you know. Uh, does your life get easier when you became a Christian or harder? For years, a lot of people said, hey, you need to accept Jesus Christ because, you know, he'll make your life better. You know. But if you're speaking to a, a rich person who's young and healthy and has all the money in the world and everything going for him right now, he, would, he could look at you and say, uh, I'm already happy. So why do I need your Jesus? See, that's not the answer. No, you have a great need for Jesus because you're in your sins. And the only thing that will forgive them was his blood shed on the cross. Your need is for salvation. And your life's going to get even harder when you get saved. But you'll be saved. But what's glorious is he'll come to live within the bush. He'll fill you with his love and his joy and his peace. Your your life will never be the same. It's a glorious life because he's real and he's risen. But then it's, life's going to get even harder, probably. Well, if life's going to get even harder, and it does, amen, and it's pretty hard right now, anyone would go, well, then why are you doing what you're doing? And why are you following Jesus Christ? What's the answer? There's only one answer, because he's real, because it's true. 
Amen? Because he's risen. Because he changed my life. And he's consistently revealed himself to us and been faithful. Just before he died on the cross, he said, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. He's talking about himself. But if it dies, it produces much grain. Here we are, because he died, that one seed. That's what he's saying. And he said, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And you know what he's doing, you guys? He's assuming that every true believer will deny himself or herself, take up their cross daily, and produce much grain, much fruit. So, let's go back. We're there. Tens of thousands of people on this beautiful green slope at the Sea of Galilee and the Lord's teaching in the boat, right? All four types of soil are there. All four conditions of the heart are there present listening to him teach. Listen, he gave that parable then and he has us right here today in the word now today to help people determine what kind of soil they represent. Which one are you? And then to decide what kind of soil they will be. That's what he was doing then, 2,000 years ago. That's what he's doing today. That's what he's doing in this room right now. And the message back then, to them that day, same message today is what? What's the message? Choose your soil. You choose. Have you given your heart to the Lord? Are you a true believer Do you know, uh, it's good to question people on that, to make sure, you know, they know the Lord. It should be a changed life. So some hearts were hard, some were shallow, some were distracted, and some were fruitful. Jesus said, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. What did he say? I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. That kind of sounds like 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. That they may have life, and then that they may have it more abundantly. It kind of sounds like fruit, more fruit, much fruit. Let him have his way in your heart. Surrender to him completely. And those four types of hearts, those four types of soil cover the whole range of human possibilities. So I want you to imagine that crowd that day, and I want you to number a bunch of pieces of paper from one to four, right? A bunch of number ones, twos, threes, four, right? And then hand went out to each and every individual person that was there in that crowd today, or or 2,000 years ago. And now hand went out to every person in this room. Everybody here is going to get a one, a two, a three, or a four. Which one are you going to get? The one is the hard soil. The two is the rocky soil. The three is the distracted soil. After the world that gets choked, the four is truly saved, the fruitful soil. Which piece of paper would you get? And you know what? Hand them out to everybody in the world right now, all of our family, everyone you know, and everyone's going to get a one or a two or a three or four right now. And we need to go out from this place knowing that as we preach the word, Because we can't see in hearts, but we've been learning he can. And he's never going to show us necessarily what's in someone's heart. But as we preach the word to keep on going and not get discouraged, we need to understand this is what happens, right? And yet he will save and he will use the word. Um, Everybody's going to fit into one of those four groups. But listen, here's here's the answer. Nobody's stuck, okay? Nobody, God didn't choose Well, I chose you as a one, I chose you as a two, I chose you as a three, I chose you as a four. No, he died for every person that they might be a four if they would freely choose. No one is stuck, you see, and that's why he was telling the parables to this crowd. Um, So it's like this. We're there that day. Group number one, 
you're the wade side, the roadside soil, the hard hearts, please step forward. Everybody who's in, who got a number one, please step forward. And we would see everyone, right, go together in a group. Everyone's going to fit into a group. Um, but that's not what it's going to be, you guys. That's not how it's going to sound. Group one, come forward. Group two, come forward. Group three, come forward. And lastly, group four, the save, come forward. You know what it's going to sound like? It's going to sound like this. Group four. Group four, the good ground, the fertile soil, the fruitful hearts, please step forward. First, step forward because, you guys, the rapture where he catches us in the clouds is imminent. Those who have a four. Step forward first. First Thessalonians 4. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of an archangel, and with a trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So, my wife and I were talking, men, about Father's Day. So we didn't talk a lot about Father's Day. And in my mind and heart, she confirmed the same thing. Start today. Start now. Today's the day. Choose what soil you're going to be. Doesn't matter. And she was telling me the story that she had heard of a testimony of a father who completely changed and became a different man, a different soil because of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, not later today, right now, in this room, right now, which soil are you? Let's close with this. If you'll look at Mark 4, 21. They had lamps that were lit by fire. Mark 4, 21 says, Also he, Jesus said to them, Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? Is it not to be set on a lampstand? That's your life and mine. For there is nothing hidden which will not be revealed, nor has anything been kept secret, but that it should come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Then he said to them, Take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. Verse 25, our last verse. For whoever has... To him, more will be given. Kind of sounds like 30, 60, and 100 fold. Yes, for whoever has, to him, more will be given. More of the Lord, more understanding, a deeper walk. But notice this Jesus says, But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So, question as we close to you What does that mean? Jesus says, Whoever does not have, Okay, you don't have even what he has. Sounds like a contradiction. Even what he has will be taken away from him. Wait a minute, Lord. You just said he doesn't have, and now you're saying even what he has. No, he's not. What's the meaning? Turn with me with, to Luke eight sixteen. Same story. Same story, same day. He's talking to the disciples. And here's the meaning. Verse 16. Jesus says, No one, when he has lit a lamp, covers it with a vessel or puts it under a bed, but sets it on a lampstand that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is secret that will not be revealed, nor anything hidden that will, be not, will not be known and come to light. Therefore, take heed how you hear. For whoever has... To him more will be given. Okay, we looked at that. And here we have it again. Jesus says, and whoever does not have, and here's the answer, even what he seems to have will be taken from him. Many people say, I am a Christian. 
I'm a Christian. What he seems to have. Do you know, I looked up the versions of the Bible, a good number of them, and they all, half of them agree and say it's what he seems to have. Now that makes sense, huh? Jesus said, even what a man seems to have will be taken from him. If you're truly saved, you'll be given more. I'll take you deeper. If you're not truly saved, even what you seem to have, remember the second soil, it it sprang up, but that rock was there. It died when persecution came. The third soil sprang up. All the cares and the love of the world choked it out. It went away. Only that fourth soil. Do you know what the other half of the Bible say? What he thinks he has. So Jesus said what a person seems to have or what he thinks he has will be taken away. And I'm telling you there are many people that if the rapture happened today would be gathering in churches in our nation next Sunday morning. Because they're one of those three types of soils and they are truly not the fourth soil. So make sure today we are that fourth soil. Amen. And as we go out and share the word, now we know what's going on beneath the surface in our hearts and in other people's hearts. And only he can do the work and the word of God is alive and the Holy Spirit always backs up the word of God. And you guys, in the time left, he wants us to, to, uh, to reach in, right? And like a Frisbee, uh, scatter the word because he's coming and he's coming very soon. After service, there'll be men and women up here on different sides. And if you want to make sure you know the Lord, you want to get saved today, you want to be sure you're going to heaven, then after the service, get up and come forward and talk with them and pray with them. Or if you need prayer for anything, come up. Again, I have to stop once in a while. Beautiful sound, huh? What do you hear? Beautiful, huh? Last thing I'm going to say before I pray. That's why the Lord's coming back soon. You have to be blind not to see that Satan and the world and evil men are seeking to destroy the children And when that happens, and it's happening, he's at the door. And so, you guys, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the beautiful sound on Father's Day, Lord, of our children. We know you're coming soon, Lord. And the passion that you had on the cross the day you died to save us and all people, Lord, is burning just as fiercely and powerfully and passionately as it did the day you died on the cross. And we praise you for that. So, Lord, we need you. We look to you. And as we started, Lord, you'll never give us more than we can handle. But, Lord, you'll give us the strength we need for the next step. And in these days, Lord, none of us can take more than one at a time. And we need to look to you moment by moment each day. And that's what we're doing, Lord. But truly, Lord, you are real. You are risen. You are faithful. You are our Lord and our God. And we want to worship you now, Lord. We thank you for your love. And we pray for all those that don't know you yet, Lord, whom we love and know. Lord, use us to share your word with them that they might come to know you and live with you forever. We ask it in Jesus' name. And all God's church said, amen, amen.